CataractCoach.com podcast series, episode number 82, with Dr. Audrey Rostov, navigating the different periods of our careers and changing gears, and also combining your practice with global teaching. Welcome back to our Cataract Coach podcast, and today I have a very special guest, and that is Dr. Audrey Rostov. Now, you've seen her name as Tally Rostov, but that's a whole other story, which we'll get into. Anyway, welcome to our podcast. Today, we're going to talk about everything ophthalmology, but the stuff that in our 30s and 40s we didn't know about transitions and changing gears in practice and in life. So, talk, Audrey, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much, Uday. It is just such a pleasure, and I'm so honored to, to be on this and to have this conversation with you. It's always lovely to sit down with friends and, and have a chat, and if we can impart some knowledge to other people that they find useful, all the better. Right. I think we went through our 30s and 40s in ophthalmology and had a great time, but you're a little bit of wool over our eyes, didn't realize what was coming and how things would change and and practice transition. Now, speaking of change, even your name. So there is no hyphen in your name. <laughs> there is no hyphen in my name. No, I when I was um, got my medical degree in my first, uh, you know, did residency and fellowship, I was known as Tally. And then I got married and everybody just loves to hyphenate my name for me but it's actually i have audrey tally rostov there's no hyphen there hasn't been but people like half of i don't know a number of my publications still have it i've tried to get rid of that hyphen it doesn't always work and you know whatever i'm still the same audrey <laughs> i love it just yeah i just roll with it it's easier absolutely you have to be what was, what was your path in ophthalmology um, I did a, I did my residency at WashU in St. Louis, and then I did a fellowship with Dick Lindstrom in Minnesota with Minnesota Eye, which was amazing. Yeah. It is a mentor and friend, and he continues to mentor me even today, which is yeah just- for for so many of us young ophthalmologists. Yeah, he's kind of had that very profound impact on a, an entire generation of ophthalmologists. Yeah, he really has. He's an amazing person and such a great role model, uh, no matter what it is, ophthalmology, life in general, when I'm having, a, you know, an existential crisis of sorts, and I message him or email him, he always makes time for me. Uh, and we'll, you know, have a sit down and have a chat. And then it really, it's so wonderful to have one of those people um, Vance Thompson is actually another for me who I know I can call, I can, you know, pour my heart out, be real, uh, tell them what's really going on. And then they just help to, to help you focus on the right path. And even though you may know what that right path is, it's really helpful to bounce things off of somebody else and mm-hmm. to have someone with a few years more experience than you do. Uh, just you know, help and be a, a sounding board and and offer some uh, some wisdom. Yeah, so true. We've learned so much from that generation. So it's kind of what I want to impart with the Cataract Coach Podcast. So when we have people on, we really have an audience geared to ophthalmologists. Typically in the 30s and 40s is probably our biggest age group. And so it's really there's so much that I did wrong. There's so many hard lessons that if I can part just a little wisdom and make your life just a little easier, ah, so worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, recently I had a a change in practice. I was with the same practice for about uh, a little over 25 years. And I was a partner in a large group practice. Uh, I built the cornea um, refractive cataract and refractive surgery parts of that practice. And then things changed. There were some um, just changes in direction of the practice and a change in management style. And I decided that it really wasn't the direction that I was going in or the direction I've always been going in. Uh, and I decided that the best given, you know, sorting out my my different options, that the best thing to do was really to leave and to start my own solo practice. And I'm in the midst of that. For the first time in my life, I've taken a sabbatical year. 
Uh, I don't know if you know, I do a lot of global health work. And so I, I work a lot with uh, Pure Blindness Project. Mm -hmm. I was with a group called Sight Life and also working with what used to be called HCP, Himalayan Cataract Project. They have since merged and the new uh, name is Cure Blindness Project. And I've just had the joy and pleasure of working with great friends and colleagues like Jeff Tabin and Matt Oliva, and done a lot of work in India, Nepal, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And wow, this, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's been really, really fun. It's been a fun journey. I love it. Like I really, truly love my global work. There's so much work to be done. I do a lot of work training ophthalmologists in their own communities, um, helping to build curricula. And it's really, really important. Also um, training mid-level practitioners like optometrists and ophthalmic nurses is another thing that um, we're doing. And I usually do that. I go on about two trips a year and have been for about the last mm, 15 years, almost 15 years now. Um, but I took this year to do a little bit more of that. And it's been uh, just a, a great adventure this year. Uh, I've been to a lot of different countries. I've um, just seen a lot of different things. I've also attended a lot of international meetings and taken again this year as my sabbatical year. And I'm getting ready to um, move into my solo private practice uh, in it in a an era of consolidation i'm going out on my own and doing a cornea cataract and refractive practice here in the seattle area uh, my new practice is bellevue precision vision and i should be up and running in about february of 2025 so we'll say q1 of 2025. that is fantastic yeah. i think that's great uh, i love to see that changing of the gears and that's all you also bring up a good point that you know sometimes you gotta shift gears you gotta change things up especially if the environment changes so i i did half-time private practice half-time academics since the year 2000 and then after 22 years two years ago i retired from the academic stuff because things changed and it was, wasn't the same anymore it's not what i wanted and the easier way for me was just to like proudly bow out pass the baton to someone else and say hey you know it's time for something different i think that's such a good point is that for younger ophthalmologists is that you don't have to feel stuck you know right. say you don't have to feel stuck if something isn't working for you of course give it a go you know and, and see if there's things that you can modify because clearly it's easier right, right. to modify and, and make things work it's really like a marriage I mean, yeah. like, it's a long-term relationship. And actually Dick Lindstrom told me that. He said, you know, your practice is like a, a marriage and you of course want to make things work and that would be the best. But at some point, if things are not working, then it's okay, right? It's okay to say this partnership isn't working and I need to do something else. And to do that as, as gracefully as possible, if possible, um, but that it's okay. You know, it doesn't mean that you failed. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It doesn't mean uh, any of those things. And it's not too late to change. Right. Uh, right. You know, if you, you still have, if there's, um, you know, Dick had said to me, you know, you have about 40 plus years as a uh, as a career, as an ophthalmologist. And so if you're talking about, you still have a, a 10 year runway or so, then do it. Enjoy it. Nah, that's such great advice. Yeah, I struggled with, there was a new administration who wanted to make big changes. I still love the patients. I still love the surgery. I still love the nurses. I still love the working with the residents, but the other parts of it were, it wasn't great anymore. And so I tried to resist it and this, and then I finally talked to my late father who passed recently and he, his advice was, he says, you know, just change gears. He says, why don't you go ask what the earliest age you can take your retirement or your pension is? So I said, I went and asked and they said, it's 52. And I said, you know, I just so happen to be 52. And here with that, I wish to retire. And so it was, it was very liberating. At first, change is scary. Mm -hmm. I was a little scared, but then, wow, now I look back and I think, 
I had to do that. This is so much better. It's just such a freeing feeling. I think once you make the decision, I think when it comes to times where there's indecision and you're not sure of what path to go on or which direction to go. And then once you actually make a decision and it's the right decision, you know it because you just have, you're de-stressed, you have that sense of relief and then a newfound sense of excitement for your next chapter. Yeah, the next challenge for sure. And I think it's, you know, as, as ophthalmologists, I mean, we have to be flexible, right? You have to be, um, well, it helps to be flexible. You don't have to be flexible, but it helps to be flexible. It helps to think in an innovative way. And I think that if we, it's helpful also as we get older, right, to um, just find new ways of thinking, right? New challenges, new ways to get your brain to work. And that's really exciting, right? It's like um, like learning a new sport or something right. or taking up a new challenge. And so, you know, for me now, my new challenge is, okay, I've got to set up a practice all by myself. And I'm learning about, you know, EHR systems and building a website and designing a logo and credentialing for insurance companies. Um, on and on and on. There's so many things. And one really cool thing is that I actually have asked some of my younger colleagues who have done this, you know, we're only in practice a few years and are starting brand new in their practices. Right. And uh, one of them, Brian Schaefer, he's, he's amazing. He's a young ophthalmologist. He has only been in practice a few years. He was with a group. It didn't work out. So he decided he was going to do his own thing. And I visited his practice. He was in practice for eight months. And what a great resource. You know, he right. does cornea, cataract, refractive, and what a great resource. And so he said, hey, here's the IT, you know, this is what I'm doing for my um, EHR. And this is how I'm doing my billing. And this is how I'm doing this. And he was just a tremendous resource and so willing to share his information and, you know, compared business plans, things like that. That was extremely helpful and really fun, right? Because uh, he looked to me as a mentor for cases and, you know, help with complex patients and all of that. And then uh, in return, I also looked to him for help just with the bare bones of setting up a, a solo right. small practice in today in 2024, right? Which is very, very different from like, you know, the year 1999 or or 2000 or when, you know, in the 19, late 90s or early 2000s, setting up a practice then looks very different from setting up a practice today. Right. right. It's fun to be able to uh, learn from each other. And, you know, when the mentee becomes the mentor. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of fun. I feel like we're so blessed, truly, to have so many wonderful colleagues in ophthalmology, and you know that you always there's people you know you can always reach out to no matter what. You can reach out to them with a clinical problem, with a practice problem or issue, something to run by, and to be able to do that in a, a safe space, right, a non judgmental. Yeah space is so important. And, you know, and to also um, model that and also be that person, I think, yeah. and, you know, like, let go of your ego, right? We're all, yeah. we made it this far, right? We all went to medical school, we all got into the most competitive, you know, program, blah, 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 blah. Like, who cares, right? <laughs> We've yeah. all done that. So what? Uh, but then it's the, the human side of humility, really, I think hubris and, you know, humility to be able to uh, reach out to someone or allow someone to feel safe to reach out to you and not to be judged and, and not to be judgmental for someone so that you can help each other through some difficult times because that could be you on the other end, right? For sure, for Sometimes sure. it has been. <laughs> yeah. We are, that's true. We all have our ups and downs there. And it, it is very collaborative. I, I really like the ophthalmology is like a small family. Mm -hmm. 
a real, it's a, it's it fun is. to help each other for sure. And we learn so much, especially setting up practice is no joke, but it's certainly doable for all the young ophthalmologists. Because again, our, our viewers and listeners skewed 30s to 40s, you can definitely do it. And if you're if you're in your first job and you love it, that's great. But sometimes your first job is like your first girlfriend or boyfriend. They're great and all, but may not be the one forever. And that's okay, too. Exactly. Just, you know, do what you got to do. You know, and each experience prepares you for the next one. Right. I think that's another thing is that each experience. So say you're in a practice for a few years and at first you thought, okay, yeah, I really love this. I'm getting busy. Great. And then a few years in, maybe not so much. Maybe some of the promises that were there changed or the management changed or you're in an academic practice and things changed or whatever it is, or you're bored right mm -hmm. or you're just not feeling fulfilled there and your vision for what you want to do uh you know when you first start five years and ten years in may look really different at that point in time and that that's okay um but then rather than wallowing and and having that angst about oh no i'm stuck you know because you could then get stuck for five ten twenty years and what's stagnant. That? Yeah, yeah, is that it's okay to realize that and to make a change. It's it's not too late to make a change. And if you're miserable, then life's way too short. And you it's just to so make a change, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I approach life. It's interesting. I just something about me was the, hit the hitting the magic five oh, hitting fifty. Outlook kind of changed. I'm like, wait a minute, for sure I'm on the second half of life by this point. And certainly second half of the career. For a 40-year career, most of us, I finished residency, I was 30, 31. Yeah, that's all right. You're you're 20 years in and mid, mid, maybe another 20 to go. So it's like it gives you pause. You it's think a little differently. You do. And I think that... You know, I think the 30s and 40s are a time where it's like, go, 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 and you're making your mark, and, you know, what's the next thing, and, you know, you're having to prove yourself both clinically and surgically, and there's so much of that, uh, that it's important to remember to take a pause every so often, and, and that and to allow truly, I mean, what now is over called as work-life balance. And also I, we talked about this at our um, mentorship meeting, work-work balance and work-life balance and decide what it is that you want. What kind of practice do you want? What do you want to do with your time? Uh, and okay. to do that and, and really that it's, you know, I think that part of it is that it's okay to want to make a change and it's okay to make a change and it'll be fine that you'll be fine right you have your skills you own your own brain and you own your own skills right those hands those surgical hands are yours and you can decide what to do with them that you have agency in that way yeah no matter what you've got an incredible skill set you want to wear four or five hundred Newly minted ophthalmologists we make in this country a year. It's a small group. You've got a great brain, a great knowledge base. You got great hands, and that skill set you will for sure be successful in anything that you do with ophthalmology. Do not worry. Exactly. You just have to make sure your moral compass is is pointed in the right direction, uh, and yeah. that you're oh you know that you're treating people well. Right. Um, and that you do the right thing. And, and whether that's, you know, of course, your family, right? Remember not to neglect your family. I think that's really important. And that's so easy for us as surgeons, right? You know, throughout the day, you're like, me, me, me. <laughs> like, it's all about me. And then, you know, you go home and you're making dinner. And then your husband says, um, I'm not one of your surgical assistants, OK? <laughs> <laughs> right. I know. I, yeah. <laughs> like you're in the kitchen, you're like, oh, yeah. He's like, no, you're asking for things to be passed to you like you're in the OR. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and it's okay if it doesn't happen immediately, right? No one's going to go blind here. Like we're talking. Right, about, right, right. Like yeah. we're talking about roasting a chicken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not, not reconstructing an anterior segment here. No. Just roasting chicken. 
<laughs> so I think it's important to, you know, as I said, to, to realize that, um, you know, the, the balance in your life and to, to make time for, I think making time for exercise is really important because it, it helps you, you know, maintain your, your physical health, which is important for your mental and your emotional well being as, as well. And I think that's something that's um, undervalued. People like, oh, I don't have time to exercise. Like, well, yeah. you need to make the time, right? You need yeah. to figure out how to make the time and whatever it is. I mean, you could walk for half an hour. Right, it, right, right. Like, it doesn't have to be something fancy, right? But yeah, just, putting it in the schedule, I think, was a game changer for me. So mm -hmm. I literally put it in the schedule as a thing to do. Yes. <laughs> as opposed to like, well, if I have free time, but no, no, it's in the schedule, it's a thing. Yeah. So. Yes. Really, really important. Yeah, that time, time management was one thing I was really poor at. Gosh, in my 30s, I was just pedal to the metal for work. I even did a Saturday clinic. It was be Saturday mornings. It always went to like 3 p.m. the morning. Right. <laughs> I know. Like, what am I doing here? It's like, you know, at some point, yeah, you got to, your kids grow up so fast. I can't believe that, you know, I come home and like the, my kids live in other states. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's it's a quiet house now. Same, same here. Yeah. Our three kids live in other states. And also, I guess, taking, you know, realizing that there's that time, too, is whatever time it is that, I mean, yeah, you could do that extra cataract or have that extra day of surgery, or you could have an extended visit with one or more of your, your children, and that that's time that you don't get back, right? Yeah. And there are opportunities, because as your kids grow up and do their own thing, they don't have as much time for you anymore. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I was I was fortunate this summer. I was an invited speaker to the AUS CRS meeting, which is such a fun meeting, like yeah. so much fun. And my our youngest daughter is uh, she's now in her third year of law school. She was doing a summer job in DC. She was finishing her job around the time of the meeting. And so basically what happened was I was at the meeting. I ended up staying for an extra few days. She flew over and met me in Sydney. And then we had um, a little over two weeks together just traveling in Australia. Awesome. And yeah, so we, you know, we went hiking and snorkeling and um, swam in a billabong and, you know, did all these fun adventures, saw, you know, creepy snakes and large spiders and yeah, a, lot of, a lot of that in Australia, I see, I've noticed. Uh, we so, climbed the, the um, Sydney Bridge, yeah, uh, the the bridge. Bridge. yeah, the bridge climb and, and just had this amazing time together. And it was just so nice to write, to make that time and to have that time. And uh, similarly, about uh, a year, a little over a year ago, my son was finishing medical school and he was able to get approved for a global health rotation to spend time with me in Ghana. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And so we spent a month traveling in Ghana together. I was doing my ophthalmology work. I was doing a, um, a cornea needs assessment in different areas in Ghana and training surgeons in cornea transplant surgery and doing some, uh, I did a cataract outreach as part of that. And so he did some different internal medicine training. But that time, you know, that we had Right. And now he's in his second year of residency in internal medicine in New York. But like that time that you have with your kids when they're in their 20s, you know, that's time again, you don't get back. And that that's really special. And, and you can kind of look back on that as uh, this amazing opportunity and experience. And so that if there are those opportunities that you have to spend, again, whether it's with your partner or your, you know, one of your one or more of your kids or family member. I mean, it's such a special time to be able to do that. And also, if you can combine, you know, some ophthalmology and then make time afterwards, that's separate time. I think, you know, time is our most, it's our most precious commodity. So we need to make the most of it. 
Yes, and that that I became acutely aware of. Like I said, after age fifty, like my most valuable assets: time and happiness. Exactly. That's what I, that's what I got to channel. Now, t about the trip in Ghana, how does a young ophthalmologist, let's say, thirties or forties, in practice, say, you know, I'd like to try one of these trips? How do they get involved? Um, I think that the best way is probably contacting through um, HC. Well through now here i go again H now cure blindness project <laughs> okay um cure blindness project is one of the groups that um does well i'm going to back up there's different types of ways that you can participate in outreach work there's domestic opportunities and international opportunities and for international opportunities there's some things um, like with Cure Blindness Project, we're training surgeons. To have, uh, and then there's also um, other groups that do more of what they call mission, traditionally mission work, which means volunteering, usually doing a bunch of cataract surgery, uh, and then, you know, helping with backlogs and, and all has value, right? There's, sure. you know, there's a huge backlog of cataract blindness in the world. And so it's helpful to be able to participate, go cure blindness or glaucoma uh, and such. And then there's ongoing projects um, of surgeon training and curriculum development. And so part of that is to decide what the commitment level is and what you're interested in doing. And that can be different for everybody, um, you know, and, and also how flexible a person is, right? If you're operating in a lower middle income country uh, that's under resourced, you're under resourced. So you're not in your own OR. You're maybe working with some equipment that may or may not work. Um, there's instruments that you have to get very, uh, very creative. Uh, <laughs> what you do and that's okay uh and it's also okay if you're not one of those people who's comfortable i mean there's people who are i've traveled with some other surgeons some who've been comfortable and some who have said yeah I, uh, not for me and that's okay like either of that's okay but i think part of that is to decide what type of experience you know what you're looking to contribute what you're looking to get out of it and how to make the most of that and so I think that's um, that's probably the first question to ask. Right. And, and then you can, there's a number of organizations around that can, you know, you can participate in different ways. And again, it just depends on what, like your, your own comfort level, um, what you are expecting um, to both give and get out of the experience and those sort, and the amount of time you have. Right. It's uh it's really a challenge. I've done one trips for used to be the Hawaiian Eye Foundation, now became the Eye Mission of the Pacific. Yeah. And some of these trips, like you'll go to a, a very remote place like Tonga in the middle of the South of the Pacific, next to Fiji and Samoa. And there's actually no ophthalmologist for the country. Mm -hmm. And or maybe there's one. And so as a result, you go there and you yeah, I basically just did a lot of surgery. But mm -hmm. the challenge is what you said. It's I, I went there. Especially when I was younger, a little too proud, <laughs> a little too confident, because you think you have these great skills, but now you have equipment that's like, well, I've never seen this faker machine. And they said, yeah, it was made 20 years ago. And now you're the inst here are the instruments you have. Like, well, you may have to MacGyver something. You may have to like figure something out here. And then the patients are the sweetest, most appreciative, but they have the most advanced pathology. Like you look at that cataract, which is a rocket, that surgery should have been done 10 years ago. So it really tests your metal as a surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a really great growth experience. It, it uh, brought me a lot more humbleness. <laughs> and you yeah. can learn new things like doing doing M6, manual small incision cataract surgery, yes. which is for a brunescent cataract, it's been shown in all these things. It's much better than FACO. So much better. So, so much better. 
Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of situations that you look at and you go, okay, well, I, I always think of it as like, here are your three tools. Like you have a roll of duct tape, right? A cotton <laughs> swab and a piece of dental floss or something like that. Like, that's what you got. Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I had, um, recently I was in uh, Eritrea which is really interesting country. They have their first ever ophthalmology training program, super exciting. The first, there's actually now a new set of residents, but the first three who are getting into their clinical training are amazing. They're bright, they're motivated, they wanna learn. And spending time uh, in the OR with them was so special. And, you know, we did some cataracts. I was there. Uh, I had gotten some um, corneas I brought with me to Eritrea from Ethiopia because Ethiopia has an eye bank. And so I brought corneas. And so the first thing was screening patients, a certain number of corneas. And okay, who gets those? Right. right. Who gets the corneas? And so part of that is decision making. Okay, who has bilateral blindness? What's the prognosis? Is it a good right. prognosis? Is it a younger person? Uh, and these are very, uh, are they available for follow-up? Right. And there's all these other things that you don't often think about that come into play when you are doing surgery like cornea transplants in under-resourced areas. And there was, I remember one little boy, he was about maybe eight, I want to say he was from a, um, a Bedouin, um, or not Bedouin, he was from a, uh, some tribe that was, uh, you know, they just migrated. Uh, it was like, like the Bedouins, but he wasn't Bedouin because it was in Eritrea. So sorry about that. But he's, he was in um, a nomadic, is what I meant, he's in a nomadic tribe. And so he's this little boy in a nomadic tribe and he comes in because he had a stick injury to an eye. Cause of course he's a boy. <laughs> it's always a boy with a stick injury to an eye. And he had a perforated cornea. He was a small perforation and doing a cornea transplant on him wouldn't necessarily be a great idea because he's in a nomadic tribe, right? There's no follow up oh, right. at all. Uh, and it was small enough that I thought, okay, I think I can glue it. Sounds great, right? Except for a couple things like lack of corneal, specific corneal glue and no mm -hmm. contact lenses. So you do, oh. so you do what you can. So there is cyanoacrylate glue available um, and you can use it in a pinch. And so I took a sterile drape and I cut a really, really small piece, a very, very thin sterile drape to patch the little perforation, put some glue on top of that, first made sure the area was clean. Um, this was under general anesthesia in the OR, obviously. So, um, and then I didn't have a bandage lens. So I, with a tree fine, I cut a um, circular area like, uh, I think it was, I did like an eight millimeter um, area of sterile thin drape to use as a bandage lens. Oh, interesting. Right. And then we patched the eye and let it set for like 72 hours. And I said, okay, don't take, like, don't do anything because it's, <laughs> take, like, I know it's not going to be infected. I'm pretty sure of that. And the glue is going to prevent anything. And then, and it was formed at the end of the case, I saw the AC formed. Nice. So I thought, okay, fingers crossed when we take this off in a couple of days. And sure enough, it had sealed in a few days. But that's what I mean is that you think, okay, yeah, oh, no, I would just do this for that. Well, okay. You don't have that. Yeah. So you don't have that. So what do you do? Or you don't have a particular instrument. So you take an instrument that's close and maybe with a hemostat, you could kind of, you know, bend it a little bit to do what you want. Right. <laughs> It's true. Oh, okay, this is what I have. Let's see what's sterile, what's going to be safe. Right. And, or, you know, yes, we have a vitrectomy machine. Great. Can I have the vitrector, please? Okay, but it's not <laughs> working. Like they have the machine, but it's right. not working. So you're like, okay, that's fine. We'll just do a WEC vitrectomy. You, you know, what you got to do. 
right? That's what you have. You have a pair of Westcott scissors and you've got some Muracell or whatever they are, some kind of sponge. Um, or sometimes you have cotton swabs and a scissor. And yeah. sometimes, you know, you have, actually there is a retinal scissor, so you make it cut as fast as you can. Yeah, like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A retinal yeah. Center. so I'm like, okay, how fast can I make my fingers move here? <laughs> That'll be my retractor. You could probably better get a couple hundred cuts a minute. You can, yeah, you can. I mean, you think about it, right? You're like, I can do like, I probably do three or four a second. Yeah. So, so maybe, it's, yeah, reasonable. Yeah. So I, you, right? You just make do with what you have, and. Um, you just have to be comfortable with that too. And that's so like that's what I mean by it's you're using your brain in different ways and you're being flexible and you're trying to do the best that you have. And just like anything else, right? Just like on our um old, I always said this about our board exams, you make the best strategic guesses with less than perfect information. Yeah, it's true. That is that is absolutely true. In life. <laughs> Right, I always, I always look at those multiple choice questions. I was like, you know, I don't really know, but for some reason I like this answer. Like, let's just yeah. go with that. There's a Which reason is, why my body, my brain likes it. Just, just go with it. It's the best strategic guess with less than perfect information. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Or it's, yeah, similarly, I had the, we had a bunch of IOLs that were donated and they donated a bunch of cartridges, to the injector cartridges, but no injectors. So I was like, okay, so we got a fashion injector, so. You know, what's long and thin, you know, what was, we found some spinal needles, other part of the hospital, long needles. Great. Sterile. Yeah. Let me just, with, 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 the, with the hemostats, let me just bend the tip so it's not so sharp. Right. And create a pushing platform on it. Push it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. And then you got, yeah, you got to do all that stuff. Oh, I think it's great. I certainly encourage any young ophthalmologist, if you have any interest in this, just do it. Even if you don't think you have the skills, you say, I don't know how to do M6. I promise on the trip, they will teach you. Yes. And you have the right. skills to learn it. By the end of the trip, you will know. <laughs> yeah, and just the, the happiness that it brought to patients was just mind-blowing. I mean, just, you've changed their lives forever. Sometimes people don't realize on these on these trips, they're, they're, people have seeing eye kids. Yes. So, the, so blind grandma or grandpa has a stick on the end of the stick, they have like a five-year-old who holds the other end and, and leads them around. Exactly. By, by fixing that cataract, which you can do in 10 minutes, you freed that kid up. The kid can enjoy now. Yeah, I mean, you really, you change not just lives, but communities. Right, for sure. And you can do, you can also, as you said earlier, you can actually do a lot of this cherry stuff even here in the US. There's plenty yeah. of need. Yeah, there's through um, ASCRS, there's the foundation and you can sign up and there's certainly plenty of people here in our own country uh, that could benefit from, you know, there's there's basically a lot of um, under-resourced communities right where we live in our both cities yeah. and rural areas. Uh, people who don't access care, cannot access care, it's difficult for them. Um, and then, but providing them with a surgery, especially a cataract surgery, uh, you can provide them with their sight back, uh, and at least some degree of sight, and then, you know, help them become, a, you know, help them with a job or, right. you know, whatever it is. I remember this was a while ago. Uh, I wasn't in practice very long. And this woman came to, the young woman came to see me. She was in her twenties. She was a super high myop. She was like a minus 20 or something. Okay. Um, hadn't been able to wear contact lenses. She had had a couple of um, corneal ulcers and had some scars, not terrible scars, but scars, wasn't able to tolerate the, um, you know, contact lenses anymore. And, you know, she's a minus 20 and her glasses were, you know, it's like so difficult. And at that time we, this was, this was before ICL. Okay. This was like, um, or ICL had maybe just come out, but it was up to minus 16, but the mm -hmm. Verisize lens, the, you know, Iris claw. The Iris claw lens went up to a minus 20. And this was probably in about the early 2000s. So this is like early 2000s. 
Iris Claw Lens is available. And I got the company to donate. I actually approached the company and said, you know, I have this young woman, here's her story. Mm -hmm. And she's minus 20. And, you know, she, her life is terrible and she has, you know, um, a small child and she, you know, has no resources. So they donated the lenses. I donated my services to put in these minus 20 lenses in to correct a refractive error. And it completely changed her life, like completely changed her life. She was able to see her kid for the first time. She got a driver's license, uh, right? She was able to then get a job and drive. And, you know, we don't think of refractive error as being a blinding condition, but it's the number one cause of blindness worldwide, globally. And, yeah, and I get it. Yeah. And you think about that, I mean, that's a, right, and that's a simple thing. You think, well, oh, it's just, you know, why can't she use glasses or something? Well, you try to use glasses as a minus 20, you know, myope. Yeah, um, that's like image minification so much that like, and then what a narrow field of view and. Yeah. You know, and, and heavy, heavy glasses. Heavy, heavy glasses. Yeah, she, she just like, she couldn't tolerate them. Um, and then, you know, she had the contact lens infections. And so that was, you know, just one local case, right? And there's certainly plenty of cataracts, uh, especially a lot in immigrant communities, you know, people who come over from different countries and they haven't gotten health care in however many years. And, you know, you see them. And then I actually, I did a case um, a woman from Ethiopia who I saw here in Seattle, and she had some corneal scarring, um, dense, dense, dense cataracts, but her daughter told me that she actually was able to see okay, like fairly well or well enough to, you know, get around and do things, um, even with her corneal scarring, presumably, before her cataracts developed. So I ended up doing like an M6 on her uh, with a chandelier technique, you know, with uh, an external light pipe to, because I couldn't really see that well through the cornea, but it's a lot easier to do an M6 if you can't see through the cornea, or, right, safer. Uh, and so I did that and got an IOL in and, you know, she improved from light perception to, it was like 2200 or something like that. But what a huge difference in her life. Right. You'd function. You'd function at 2200. Exactly. You can have ambulatory vision at 2200. Yeah. Um, and that made just the world a difference for her. So that's, you know, so there's those things too, or even domestically, there's plenty of patients from under resourced communities right here where we live uh, that can benefit from our skills. Yeah, sometimes I think maybe I should. I, 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 we have got such a great skill set, and I think maybe I should be working five, six days a week so I can do more and more surgery, help more people. But there, as you said, the work work balance, the work life balance, you got to figure something out. You have to, yeah, because if you spend too much time on work and too much mental energy there, then you don't have enough time to regroup and rest and recover. And having t enough time for yourself and whatever else, you know, and whoever else you want to have time with makes you a better doctor, right? Like oh, I could say, like, I'm a really, I'm a great surgeon normally like four days a week. I'm a fabulous surgeon, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, yeah. Like I, I know for me, I, for a great day of surgery the night before, I got to sleep early. I got to have my weighted blanket. <laughs> I got a routine I got to do, and just that helps me. So right. Uh, so sure. you have to, yeah, you have to decide on again, like what's important to you, and and how you can function the best. If you're working all the time, that's not necessarily functioning at your optimum. I mean, when I go away and I'm working, like in India or Nepal or Ghana or wherever, they're really, really long days, and I'm working, you know, day after day after day. And that's fine because you're kind of, it's just like adrenaline high or whatever, you know, you're on it and you're like ready to go. But then after that, I always need, you know, two days. Yeah. I need like, 
you know, even after being in like India and Nepal and really busy, I like a day at the end of my trip where I stay in a nice place. Maybe I go shopping or to a spa or something like in Delhi, right? I'll stay in like something like, okay, I just want like a day where almost I don't leave my hotel room. It's nice here, right. you know, or something like that. Or I, I pop over in London for uh, a couple of days after my trip to just, you know, regroup. Yeah, <laughs> I do the same thing for sure. So even if I'm on the lecture circuit like you, I'll book in a few extra days or even a lot of extra days for just some enjoyment. Yeah, you yeah. have to. Because it's yeah. silly. I, I think it's it's unfortunate when people like go somewhere and they're like, yes, I'm going to go to this meeting. I'm going to go there for 48 hours. I'm going to give my lecture. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to leave. You're like, well, you could be anywhere. Right. Yeah, that, that was me when I was in my 30s and even early 40s. That was me. Fly in, spend more time in the air than on the ground. Right. Exactly. And you know, I mean, part of it is also getting to know our colleagues um, internationally, right? And, right? and now having friends all over the world is so special and, and making that time and having that time to share a meal, to break bread, to do whatever, you know, it is. And right. It's really um, just so joyful. I was in, I told you I was in at AUS CRS recently and that was super fun. And then I was in Sydney. I was actually had a, a few days before waiting for my daughter to arrive. And I met some German colleagues uh, at the um, AUS CRS meeting and they were in Sydney too. And so then we ended up spending a day, we went hiking and, you know, oh. we, shared ice cream together and dinner. And then another friend of mine that I met last time I was at AUS CRS, he and his wife, um, uh, Jared and Gina Sutton, um, invited me and my daughter to dinner and so with their daughter. And it was just so great to, you know, have that time together where you have, um, you know, you form your meaningful friendships. Yeah. And I think ophthalmology, it just really allows us, or I mean, I, I feel really fortunate. It's just allowed me to um, be a part of, you know, the world in a different place and to meet people and have experiences and opportunities that I wouldn't, I think, ordinarily have had. Yeah, and ophthalmology is a really special, special, a very special subspecialty. It's really amazing. It's a small family. The friends you make. I was in the ESC race recently in, in Barcelona. Yeah. And I, I booked a separate day after the meeting where I took a bunch of ophthalmologists and we arranged a, a private wine tour in Catalan countryside. I'm like, it's a pleasure to bond with these fellow ophthalmologists. What a life. That's so great. It's, I mean, that's what it's all about, really, right? And and a lot of times that's where, you know, some of the best ideas come from, too. Right. In fact, they did. It was we, we obviously talked a lot of ophthalmology, but it was a, a global thing. I had an Argentinian ophthalmologist, a Brazilian one, an Indian one, American. I was covering all corners of the globe. <laughs> and we just had a fantastic time. And it was uh, it was it was very special. But yeah, I, similarly, I did. I was in Australia giving lectures last month and I just it was one week in one city, one week in another. So the week between. I just booked four days in Manly Beach, which is my favorite part of Sydney. That's so beautiful. Yeah, that's where I went with um, with the Beckers, with Lena and David Becker. So oh, that's but I did the, I'll probably did the, the Manly to Spitbridge hike. Yes, so we did the, the hike there and that was super fun. We just had such a great time and we had ice cream and we took the boat back and uh, had a nice dinner with also colleagues you know, in Sydney and it was so much fun. It was just great. Yeah, I know for for sure. So that's a that's a good way of balancing it out. So it I is. wish you the best of success with your practice. I have no doubt you'll be incredibly successful. And I love that you're like, you know what? Let me take a year sabbatical, and then I'm gonna go back to it with a newfound energy. And oh, you're gonna crush it. I love it. Well, thanks, Uday. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about it. I think it'll be. It's been a new adventure. And I, fortunately, my um, my husband's in finance. He's a CFO, and he's helping with the financial aspects and the business plan of my practice. So I'm very fortunate there. Nice. Uh, and yeah, we'll we'll just 
we'll see how it goes. But it's um, it's nice to have a new project to to work on, and to you know it's it's not too late to do a change. And I guess that's the that's the main message for right. ophthalmologists in your thirties and forties. If it's not working for you, that's okay. Switch gears. Don't wait because you know, if you wait another year or two years or five years and you're still having the same conversation about being stuck, mm -hmm. that's on you. <laughs> right, 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 right. And then the and even in your 50s and 60s, okay to change gears still. Okay to change Absolutely. gears as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no, totally. I mean, it's it's yeah, I mean, it's your life. You only get one. Yep. And if we take your advice and incorporate that exercise, we'll add a few more years so that you can, you know, <laughs> have you a longer go. journey. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's well, right. I want to thank you again. What a pleasure just talking to you. The hour went by like this. I can't even believe it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, you Dave. It's great to chat. Oh, my my pleasure to have you. I'm going to actually I'll give a link below, whatever links you want me to put there, maybe your social media. Maybe people can contact you or direct message you if they have a a question, sure. want to reach out. Absolutely. And then, and then certainly we can link any of your, your work with these uh, projects as well so that the young ophthalmologists can check that out. Perfect. Sounds awesome. good. All right. Now, and if you have any surgical video you want us to feature on Cataract Coach, I always offer any of my podcast guests, you can send me any video you want. I promise I'll feature it. Anything about five minutes long. Just think about it. <laughs> and then finally, I want to remind our listeners and viewers, remember, we got a new podcast every single week. It's on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. Anywhere you find your podcast, you find the Cataract Coach podcast, which is now the top podcast in all of ophthalmology. Plus, of course, we have a new Cataract Coach video every single day, no matter what. And if you're a young ophthalmologist still learning, no matter where you're on the world, you have a free curriculum series, a 25-part video curriculum series of how to learn PACO. And there's a free Cataract Coach PDF book. Just go to cataractcoach.com and download it. It's yours. Anyway, until next time, we'll check you later.